Casey Smith. Yo, what's up, man? Good to How see you. How are you, dude? I'm good. I'm good. Left foot yeah. in front of the right foot, day by day. Definitely, man. Definitely. Well, thank you for taking the time to be here and join us for the uh, the Music Business Club Happy Hour. I've got a cowboy cold Modelo here. Yeah, I got it's, a little uh, a juicy seven out East there. Coast. You got a little uh little uh, grapefruit cocktail there. Uh, champagne and grapefruit, actually. Nice. Yeah. Nice. A West Coast drink. It's warm. It's warm today. <laughs> nice, nice, man. Well, dude. Um, so I know that I know that you've seen uh, a number of these streams. You and I obviously have worked together uh, here and there on shows for a couple of years. So it's really awesome to have you have you be uh, be the guest of honor this week. Um, while we're, while we're um, waiting for a couple of people to tune in, I wonder if you could kind of take us take us through a walk down your trajectory in the music industry and kind of how you got to where you are today. I know you, before you were a talent by you, you worked on the other side of the table as a, as an agent, right? I was. Yeah. But even before that, I was, I was at, I was at a club in, uh, in, in Colorado. What, when I first started, I, I mean, I was probably, I, I kind of got into it pretty late, like 23, 24 years old. I had moved to Durango, Colorado, just kind of like wanted to be a ski bum raft guide, like go rock climbing. I mean, kind of like people always joked like Durango was this town where young people like went to go retire. And mm -hmm. I, was, I was very much like kind of live in that, that life for a while. And, but there was this amazing little community radio station called KDUR in Durango, Colorado. It was all uh, freeform radio, community radio station. You can literally play whatever you wanted. And I got signed up to do a little like two and a half hour slot at like seven thirty in the morning on Thursdays, and I just like I just loved it. I would just go in there. I, I would play everything I wanted to play. I, I, I just kind of it was kind of like my creative outlet in, in music, going to festivals, going to shows, collecting records, and eventually, like I kind of got this like you know what I thought was a, a very brilliant idea that if I you know, talked about certain concerts on my radio program that I would be able to get free tickets in, into concerts. So that, like, I was like, this is my avenue to like go see pretty lights down at the Abbey theater. This is my, this is where I can go see green sky bluegrass and all these like amazing, like up and coming Colorado bands that mm -hmm. I was just really into. So I contact, you know, the owner and he was just like, hell yeah, man. Like talk about all you want. I'll give you two tickets. So I eventually just started doing that and just eventually getting more and more involved, like in the venue. Like I was like, well, you want me to hang posters? He was like, sure, hang posters. Like, want me to change the marquee? He was like, yeah, change the marquee. And I was like, oh, your Facebook was kind of like messed up. Like you should have me like do it. So eventually I just started doing more and more things at the venue. And uh, he eventually started paying me $100 a week uh, to work at the venue. And I was like, kind of answering his emails he, like he, he was this very uh like silent like owner guy he, like didn't didn't do a lot in like place like needed a lot of work and i was i was happy to do it all just because like i was i was in love with it and we got an email it was for green sky bluegrass actually uh and they wanted to come play and i was like chuck dude you got like you got to book this band green sky bluegrass he was pretty hesitant about doing it it was like 1500 bucks or something mm -hmm. i was like dude you have like we got to do green sky we got to do green sky and eventually he was like all right put your money where your mouth is man you split the show with me you give me 750 bucks up front i'll do the other 750 and then we'll split all the profits i was kind of backed into a corner i went home like you know like borrowed some money asked my girlfriend if i could like have 100 bucks dug under the mattress <laughs> uh you know and was able to, you know, get some money. The show sold out. I got my 750 bucks back, plus, like, I made some money on the show. And at that point, I was just, like, I was hooked. Like, I, you know, I, 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 it blew my mind that I was able to, like, make money, like, on music. I was like, oh, my God. Within a couple of weeks, I went into my restaurant gig and, like, told them, like, I was now working in the music industry. And I just kind of, like, went all in, like, after that. Started just booking shows. And the club started like, you know, he was putting up for sale. He was getting out. And I, I realized I needed to get out. And uh, I'd been booking a bunch of shows with Paradigm. So I put my application in. They hired me in a ticket accounts coordinator position out in Monterey, California, and packed my bags and went and, you know, did ticket accounts out in, uh, at Paradigm Talent Agency in Monterey. 
Uh, so it was the music business that brought you to the West Coast. Yeah. I yep. didn't realize that. That's awesome. Yep. So, I mean, that's where, you know, Thomas Cousins and I first, um, you know, met each other. He was on Aaron Pincus's desk at that time. I was doing ticket counts for Pincus, which is a, you know, a, 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 you know, a full-time job in itself. Right. Uh, so I was, right. uh, I was interacting with Thomas a lot. Um, very, very intense position. Um, but yeah, so you know, that's, that, that's kind of how I started. I was there for two years. Eventually I, you know, decided I wanted to move to Nashville. I was able to get an assistant job out in out in Nashville, Tennessee, in the fair and festival department, and kind of like worked my way up from there and became an agent in, in Nashville um, in the fair and festival department, kind of booking all Paradigm's clients at fairs and festivals. And were you working on, were you uh, an agent assistant or were you in a totally different role, just like doing administrative stuff for fairs and festivals and not working with an agent who had a specific roster? I was working. I was working uh, as an agent assistant uh, originally for this uh, one of the original guys that started what was then Monterey Peninsula Artist uh, before it became Paradigm. Before they they, they bought Monterey Peninsula Artist, uh, Steve Dahl. He he opened the Nashville office. Oh yeah, it's just one of the most amazing like legends of, of of the music industry. He literally looked like Santa Claus. He like was just one of the most loved and respected guys in the business. And I, I was just so fortunate to be able to go out there, you know, land with him. He, you know, just also just gave me like a ton of responsibility, which a lot of agents don't do. And it's, a, uh, um, you know, I, I, you know, I, I feel bad for some of these assistants who work with maybe kind of younger agents, or maybe they're, they're, they're really protective of, of their work. And they don't really kind of give these younger people responsibility to, you know, book shows, to make mistakes, to, uh, you know, to really kind of like just get it, get in the grind of it. And Steve was just happy to like let me do it. Maybe he was kind of like in the sunset period of his career, and he you know, just doesn't have like the work off on me. But I also think he like legitimately just wanted to learn. I think he he knew that you know it was time for him to kind of like pass the torch and. And so I, you know, I just learned really quickly just by doing, I think most people can kind of relate, like, you know, if you just, once you just jump into something, you, you learn so much quicker than, you know, just taking notes and, uh, you know, kind of, kind of sitting on the sidelines. You gotta, you gotta get on the court and play. So yeah, I, know, I, I, was, I was really fortunate to have had that experience and just be able to move up like so, so quickly. Yeah. So when, so starting in a club in Durango and, uh, making the transition over to Paradigm, you know, in a lot of senses, you know, there's like promoters work on one side of the table and agents work on the other. In reality, everybody's got to work together and, you know, we're all on the same team because we all want to have successful shows. But did you find that um, there was like a perspective shift when you went over to Paradigm and, and then again came back over to the promoter side? How, how, did, uh, how did that kind of like different angle on the same type of work uh, help you develop over those over that period of time. I mean, it's I mean, you're using two different sides of your brain, really. Um, kind of when you're when you're working on on both those sides. Uh, I mean, a huge difference really is like you're 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 very wanted, you know, when when you're at Paradigm too. I mean, like you know, like we had this amazing roster of clients at the time like it was the peak of kind of festivals. Everything was just like exploding. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was just, it was, I wouldn't say it was easy. I mean, it was a lot of work, but like it was very wanted, you know, like in the, your, your email, the, the, the paradigm email, like name went a long way. Mm -hmm. People were just like very hungry, you know, to book shows with you. And, you know, out here, like we're in, we're in secondary markets, tertiary markets, not to say that there's like not respect and that the people like don't want to do shows with us, but like, it's, it's a different grind, you know, like we, we're, we're hustling, we're, we're, you know, trying to get a lot of attention and that, that like kind of shift was, you know, was, it was a huge difference like for me, it, kind of shifting from taking in, you know, have a lot of emails coming in and just kind of filtering them to be on the other side, like really like pounding the pavement, you know, you're, you're kind of eating what you kill. You're, you're, you're just, it's just, it's just a different type of grind. 
Yeah, yeah. yeah. Eating what you kill is a real thing uh, for sure yeah. in the music business. So um, I, I'm going to get out of here in a couple minutes and and let the uh, let the questions start flying in the comment section. But how many venues are you currently booking? Uh, right now, it's the Mystic Theater and. I'll go now, uh, north to south. Uh, Mystic Theater in Petaluma, California. Uh, south of that is the Cornerstone in Berkeley, California. And then our new venue, Felton Music Hall in Felton, California, which is about 10 minutes up the road of Santa Cruz. And the Catalyst in Atrium in Santa Cruz. And then the Fremont Theater uh, in San Luis Obispo. And yeah, man, the Fremont Theater is one I, I've actually never had the pleasure of stepping foot in. How big is that one? Is it a 1,200 cap theater? Nine, 900 capacity, Nine. theater, 800 seated. Mm -hmm. yeah. Beautiful, yeah. like beautiful old Art Deco. It's kind of one of these old classic, like, you know, just California theaters that they've renovated and, and, and made into a venue. Uh, like, you know, the guys down there have just put in like tremendous amount of work, new, new staging, new sound system, tore out like a bunch of seats, like got a real nice like pit. It's like a pit in the front, seats in the back, right in the heart of downtown San Luis Obispo. It's just like, it's just, it's a rad, rad venue. Awesome. Rad awesome, venue. man. Um, cool. Well, um, I know that there are a couple of new, like obviously we're in COVID times and there have been a lot of alliances, organizations popping up, try, you know, the industry basically trying to find ways to support each other. And I know that you're uh, you're part of a couple of these. Do you want to tell us about um, NEVA and the uh, Independent Promoter Alliance and IndiePromoter.org? And if you if you want to kind of tell us yeah. about those, I'll get out of here and uh, we'll we'll leave it to the comments from there. Huh? Cool. Awesome. Um, I mean, yeah, and it's been you know, obviously very trying times on concert venues, especially it's, uh, you know, once, once COVID hit concert venues are the first things to close down and we will now be the last things to open back up. Um, and I just really think during this time, it really kind of, uh, illuminated and illustrated a lot of the issues just kind of going on with venues going on with, um, e even just some of the holes uh, within the promoter community. And there was this kind of amazing response uh, with all the promoters, all the venues in the nation, where I think everybody collectively realized that we are all, all dealing with the exact same problem. We are all, you know, struggling in this situation to figure out how we are going to make it through this pandemic where we cannot do business. There's no takeout orders. There is no you know, online sales, we rely strictly on putting people in mass quantities inside of venues and congregating them very closely together. And the more people I could put in a venue closely together, the better I am at doing my job. And obviously that's restricted right now. And, and, and you know, rightfully so, like for, you know, the health and safety of, of our communities. But with that, like we have to figure out ways to survive. And also when we get out of these uh, outside of the pandemic, how are we going to be like stronger in the future? How are we going to make sure that it's, when something else like this happens, that we are set up where we aren't just going to flounder and fail? So the first organization that um, really popped up uh, immediately was this organization called NEVA, the National Independent Venue Association. And their main goal uh, especially from the get-go, was to unite venue owners and to get them to collectively use their power and their voice to get legislation passed really at the top level. So they, you know, hired a, a, a local, a, a, a lobbying group who was able to kind of collectively get everyone together to then use that lobbying group to find congressmen who wanted to support, you know, direct funding going to venues, uh, direct funding, like going to helping our, our industry, and then getting these letters out and going all the way up to to the top, to Mitch McConnell and Nancy Pelosi and uh, our, our, our leaders in the Senate. So uh, it's it's been a really amazing process. There's over like 2,000 venues involved in NEVA. 
Uh, I'm working as kind of the Central California precinct captain for for Neva and working with our venues there and trying to work with other venues in, in Central California uh, to just really try to get the word out as much as possible to get fans engaged, patrons engaged, local communities engaged, you know, mayors, city councilmen uh, to make sure that they are, you know, going up the ladder and 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 holding their leaders accountable and making sure that they are not forgetting about our side of the industry. So that's, that's, that's one of them that's popped up. And then the other one that I'm on the board of is the independent uh, promoter Alliance, the IPA, which kind of collectively the same thing. We, you know, organize all the promoters across the nation independent. So it's, it's really kind of more or less everybody, but like Live nation and AG uh, where we can, uh, work together collectively, uh, help share information to, you know, use our collective force for bargaining power, whether that's like through insurance companies, uh, you know, help, you know, again, share information about how, how shows did, where we can, you know, start internship programs, where we can potentially get healthcare for promoters, you know, by, you know, help get it in bulk, you know, get discounts at, uh, you know, for conferences or subscription-based services. Uh, so those are those are really the 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 two. And like, you know, I, I you know I think especially with the Independent Promoter Alliance, you know, a lot of promoters act independently, and they they, they kind of just exist in, in in their own silos and their own bubbles. And it's really hard when something like this happens to be able to to stand on your own two feet. And I think we can all relate to, to, to a lot of things in life when you, you have a support structure around you. It's, it's easier to persevere. It's easier to go forward. It's easier to have the confidence to take, take another step, maybe take a risk. And, you know, the, really the goal of the independent promoter Alliance is to be able to do that. We do not want there, this to be a two horse race, AG and live nation when all is said and done, you know, so we we need to unite together. We need to link arms to really make sure that all these independent across the nation who do you know some of the the hardest work and most valuable work, especially for emerging artists, um, to to survive. Like we we need not only to survive but to be able to grow and prosper in in the future once we get out of just this this horrible mess that we're in. So yeah, I think we just put it up on the bottom. Um, so those are, those are the two organizations. I mean, if anybody, uh, would like to go there, you can, you can sign up, you can donate, uh, there for, for, for the organization. Um, all right, let's move into some questions. So what is the current landscape for booking shows right now? Um, it's, a, it's, it's tough. Like, I really don't think anybody rationally is booking anything in, in 2020, at least not, at least not on a national level. I, I am doing some stuff on a more regional level. Luckily in Felton, we have a restaurant attached there. So we're in a, a, a different phase because of, because of the restaurant. So we're actually able to put some acts on stage, very limited capacity, but you know, the idea that, uh, you know, bands are going to be playing in the venue in 2020, especially in the state of California, where there probably are the strictest guidelines. Uh, it's, it, it's just kind of hard to fathom. It's kind of hard to, to, to wrap our heads around that. Um, what's kind of going on though, is you're, you're seeing a lot of artists book in, you know, either really late 2020, and then kind of doing these like, well, let's also hold in like spring. And then like also give me a third backup plan for like July. So I think, you know, we as promoters, like, I mean, that's typically not something that we would ever do. Like I wouldn't confirm a show like pre-COVID and then like give somebody a backup plan and then an, an additional backup plan. But, you know, we all have to be like pretty malleable in, 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 the, in these times and, and that's that's just kind of like the reality that we have to to deal with and i think once we know get more information we can know if we're able to move forward with something we can either just accept it and release the backup plan 
or if it's just not going to happen, we can pivot immediately and and move to to uh, round two. Um, let's see. How are deal structures going to change because of COVID? Um, every promoter is really dealing with it differently. I think. I think most importantly, like promoters are are really uh, needing like to, to protect themselves. I mean, for two major reasons, we're you know people are taking pretty big financial hits right now, as we're just not doing anything. Uh, but also, when we get out of this, we don't know what the world is going to look like. We don't know what the economy is going to look like. We don't know if you know people are going to have the, the the amount of income to want to go spend money at a concert or if people even psychologically will want to be in a venue with a thousand people. Like we, we just don't know that. And bands, agents, managers, I think they're all, they, they understand this as well too. And so there's, there's been a lot of just kind of agreement between the promoter and the agent and the managers recently that to kind of have like a way less risk on the front deal where artist isn't making as much money initially, but there's still great potential on the back end for them to to make the money that they would have made on, on a deal previously. Uh, every every case is different. We're we're really not trying to have any like strict, you know, like necessary rules or guidelines of, of, of how we do it. I think the most important thing that everybody's doing, especially what I'm doing, is just really having that open conversation with agents and just letting them know, like, like if if this thing goes belly up, if it goes awry, like you know, we we need to work together. And surprising, not surprisingly, but like just uh, you know, it's it, it's it, it's been really uh, good knowing that these agents have like all kind of like agreed to that. They're 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 all they're not here to to pull one over. They're not trying to put anyone out of business. You know, they just want to get the economy, the uh, the live music ecosystem back to where it was and they're willing to they're willing to do that and i think bands bands are too i mean they're you know of course they want to go back on the road and make money but they just you know they're, they just want to get back to some somewhat of normal i think we all realize that there's going to be some sacrifices to be able to get to that point all right do you find streaming numbers in local markets correlate to ticket sales in those markets? How do you decide numbers to take seriously and which ones not to take seriously? Um, that's a, that's a good question. I, and I don't think there is like a definitive answer on it. I do notice, you know, and it's, and it's really hard to actually get the, the, this hard data. Like, you know, it's, we, we necessarily can't go into Spotify and say like, give us the top like 300 artists, like streaming on Spotify in, in Berkeley, California or Felton, California right now. But when I do see that an artist is in like, you know, top five most listened and it is Oakland or San Francisco, I, I tend to like go a little harder on that. I tend to know that people in that area are really listening to it. And, you know, we use a lot of other algorithms too, especially with artists, you know, like based on uh, like, you know, you can see kind of where they're streaming on YouTube, um, Nielsen sound scans. So while there's not like a definitive, uh, an actual definitive algorithm that we use, I think kind of piecing it all together and where you see little pockets like constantly pop up, uh, you can kind of know to make like a more, educated like guess on it i've i've really found um like with certain arts with certain types of acts it, it correlates more and it th than others hip-hop streaming numbers like they don't necessarily translate to to ticket sales whereas i think something like reggae or even like jam bands they they do you know, hip. I feel like hip hop streaming is a little more like it's just on a playlist. Maybe people are listening to the song and they don't even know who the artist is, or it's just like something that they 
they listen to in their fraternity and, and it, it, it's kind of a flavor of the month and then, and then it goes away. Whereas something that has kind of more intrinsic communities behind it. And it's really like people are listening in that community with, with certain types of genres. Then I think, I think it does carry a, a lot more weight. In non COVID time, how many shows per month were you doing? I mean, between all of them, I don't know, maybe, let's see, I'll do the math. It was probably between like 60 and 80 shows between all the venues um, pre-COVID time. And that's with, you know, the, the, the small rooms, that's local shows, um, just prep, you know, private events, like organizing all that. But yeah, like 60, probably 60 to 75 shows, shows a month. Uh, what's my favorite West Coast band right now? Um, I just heard something actually the other day. I it's just like amazing young jam band uh, from Southern California. They're called Pacific Range. They just released a record a couple months ago, and it's really really good. It's a it's a, it's a great like very like dead influenced uh, kind of jam band. All right. What advice do you have for an artist who wants to get noticed? How do club shows affect their ability to get on festivals? Um, I think a couple of things for an artist to to get noticed by a talent buyer, to get noticed by a promoter. Uh, I think it's important. I mean, really in anything that you do, no matter who you're communicating with within the business, to know that their time is really valuable who, who, who you're communicating with. And with that, you want to make sure that when you are communicating with them, and especially if it's your first time communicating with them, that you are making the information as clear as, as possible. And that as much information is in there that is uh, concisely in there too for, for them to use. So I can email like, well, you know, I, I get these all the time. Like, hey, man, like we got a band where we, we could sell a lot of tickets. Like what dates do you have? And it just like I, I honestly probably like won't won't do much with that with that uh, <laughs> with that information. But if somebody kind of comes to me clearly, I'm like, hey, man, we have this new band. We're going to release a new record in, in, in April. Um, here is a link to our music. Here's a link to our music videos. Our last show that we did, we did like 100 paid at XYZ Bar. And I'm going to put one or two other bands on there. You know, what, uh, like, we're looking for dates between this time and this time. And that, like, provides a lot more information for somebody to actually work with. That actually allows somebody to, you know, for, for me to kind of paint a picture in my head to understand what this is, to see what they're worth, to, to, to know that they're like ready to, to put in some work, that they're a little more organized, um, you know, it, and it just gives you a little bit of confidence to then want, want to work with them as well. I mean, for me, I, I really view my relationship with bands. It's not a competitive thing. It's not like I'm not working against the band. And I think sometimes bands think that like, you know, promoters are maybe trying to pull a fast one on them and they have to fight or, you know, it's like, you know, they're like doing us a favor by playing our rooms. I really like truly believe that my relationship is very symbiotic. And if a band wants to work with me and they come to me and they're like, hey, like we, we, we love what you guys are doing. We want to work with you or vice versa with me. I go to a band and say, I love you. I want to be your promoter. I want to work with you in the, in, in the future, that type of, uh, that type of communication and, and really kind of putting yourself out there as somebody that wants to be a partner in growing your careers together, uh, goes, goes a long way. And 
So when a band like comes to me and they, they say that they want to do the work, they say that they want to be a partner on the show. They say that they're going to like be on the, on, on the street, hanging up posters and that they're going to get these, these types of fans out. And, you know, I'm, I'm probably going to do the show with you. You know, it's a, that, that's the type of thing that, that you want to see now to go to the next, the next point, like how does that club affect their ability to go on a festival or get to the next le next level? You know, w once you start selling tickets, then everybody starts like paying attention to you. You know, like I, you know, was working with, you know, multiple Santa Cruz bands that, you know, once they start selling out uh, the atrium, you know, start selling out film music hall, you know, I'm, I'm sending around to everybody in the company, like, Oh, like, Pacific Roots just sold out, you know, like the atrium the place was packed, the place was vibing, you know, like they're great to work with. They, they were hustling, you know, and it just makes you want to continue that, that relationship forward. So that's these, these slots, you know, the, like the next level, it becomes more and more coveted, you know, it, it, the, the, the avenue to get in there. So many people want to play those stages. So many people want to, want to be on that festival lineup. And it's sure, of course, maybe a, a, a festival producer just loves your record and they just, they just want to do it for, for shits and giggles, but they, they, they probably want something that's worth tickets, something that the community has like clearly like recognized and people are going to come out and people are going to support them and that they're going to be part of the longer story of Cali Roots or Levitate or, or, or whatever festival it is. So, you know, I, 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 it, it, it starts very, you know, at the very beginning and then that kind of momentum and that, and that process and that, that, that desire to really work, to really grow, to have a long-term vision is what, is what gets you, you know, on, onto those, onto those stages. All right. What is the most fair deal structure for both artists, venues, and promoters. I mean, really just a percentage of door deal is I think the most, uh, it's the most fair, fair deal. It, you know, sometimes artists or agents will come to you and they'll, and they will say that, you know, a, a promoter who is just giving a percentage of the door doesn't really have any stake in, in the show. And it's just, it's just not true. You know, we have advertising costs that we got to adhere to. We got to pay for staff. Uh, also by me having a show on the calendar means I don't have another show on the calendar that we could be making money on. Uh, and it allows the artist then if they do sell a good amount of tickets to make a good amount of money. And it, you know, it, it also kind of in, entices the artists to I think then put put the work in too, and as long as you guys are communicating with each other, everybody's staying on top of each other. Uh, the shows usually go successful, and most honestly, most most acts that I work with that can understand that, and agents that that kind of understand this deal structure, they know it's probably the best thing for the artist, and it's a it's it's good it's good for us too. It, like it, it 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 allows us to do our job well. All right, let's go down to Mike Clark here. Given the logistics and safety factor during this pandemic, what are your thoughts on drive-in concerts? It's actually something we looked into down in San Luis Obispo and, and um, there is a drive-in theater down there. I, I, I think it was something that was like really cool to do, like just, it was a novelty thing and you know people could could kind of go out and do it. It, it it's not really economically that feasible for promoters to do it you can maybe fit 200 cars in there you know you charge 100 bucks a car you got to build a stage you got to put sound on you got the artist has to get paid promoters probably not making a whole ton of money artist isn't making a whole ton of money i mean if people want to do it you know, just for, for the fun, just to do something for the community, like Godspeed, like go out there, go out there and do it. Um, 
you know, it, 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 it honestly, it seemed like a, you know, just a ton of work and, you know, potentially something financially really irresponsible to do, um, you know, during, during this time where you're just adding kind of extra risk and not really going to lead to, you know, anything that great. Now, the artists that were doing it, I think it is creating a lot of like very memorable experiences. So I think there is maybe like some spiritual currency that is like in, involved in these drive-in concerts. And maybe, yes, if you can piece like a bunch of them together as an artist, it, it, it might be good and even as a promoter. But for the most part, most promoters have kind of like backed away from it. And they're kind of realizing that there just isn't, there just isn't a lot of money, money to be made. Something interesting that I've, I've, you know, kind of going off of that, that I've heard about recently and I'm starting to have conversations with agents about is doing more of an artist will, will do a live stream. And let's say they're, they're in Brooklyn, New York or, or wherever they're going to do a live stream from Brooklyn and then they're going to broadcast it. And then we would, you know, stream it, uh, in our venues at, at these kind of limited capacities, uh, across the nation. Um, so I feel like this is kind of like an interesting way, of, like around this problem of, you know, having, being able to attract minimal people, be able to, to get a show out to as many people as possible. And, you know, venues are then able, you know, they have the stage, they have the sound already, you know, they have, they have their staff, they have their bar, they have their liquor licenses. And, you know, even if you're doing a half capacity or 30% capacity, it, you know, still might be, you know, profitable. You made a couple of shekels of beer on, on beer sales and you get to see, you know, this whatever artist streaming and it's kind of, you know, across the nation, you know, and, and the way they're kind of talking about it is be this very engaging thing, you know, where the artists in Brooklyn will give a shout out to San Luis Obispo, give a shout out to Santa Cruz, give a shout out to Berkeley. Um, so I, th I feel like the shift has kind of gone more towards the live streaming. It seems like the drive-ins are, you know, kind of wearing off. Um, and, and, and people just aren't really seeing that as, 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 as really a way forward. All right, let's go to Jay. How important is it to have a booking agent? Um, it's a, I mean, it depends on really what, what level you're, you're at. I, I think once you get to a certain level and you obviously have a, you know, a, a real product you're putting out, you have a real show that you're, you're moving forward and you actually can kind of recognize that there's people outside of your, your, your local market that want to see you. Um, I think it can be it can be very incredibly beneficial. I mean, there's here's somebody that is waking up every single day, going to bed every single night, kind of thinking about how they're going to help propel your career forward, how they're going to you know get you good shows, how they're going to get you on festivals, searching out opportunities for you to support larger shows. But that's really like only somebody's only going to do that and probably do it well if there is like a viable product for, for you to do it. And an agent to me, you know, especially being on the agency side and knowing how much work goes in just to, to booking a tour and, and, and booking clients. Uh, it, it's, it's a, it's a lot of work and it's, it's something that's like incredibly hard for uh, an, an act to do. And if you're booking your own stuff, you know, you can, you can probably attest like, you know, how much, how much work goes into it. Not to mention when you are at an agency and uh, you, you, you kind of earn the respect within, within the industry, you know, people answer your calls. They, they answer your emails. They you know, pick up the phone, phone when you call. They know what promoters in certain markets are the right promoters for you to work with. They know which venue, you know, you probably should be playing. They, they, they have a contact over at a radio station, know some local publications. Like uh, an agent isn't just someone that, that book shows. An, an agent really like gets shit done and they, 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 they put a lot of work in. And if you're, if you're at that level to uh, 
kind of attract the t- attention outside of your own market, I I think it's I think it's incredibly valuable. And um, you know, making sure you have the, the right agent that is actually really passionate about your music is is key number two. You know, you see a lot of agents who don't have the heart, don't have uh, the the desire to to book an act, and you know that, that that's not doing anybody any favors. What do you think about weekly and monthly residencies? Um, well, it's actually <laughs> during during COVID times. I think it's uh, I think it's I think it's the way forward right now. We actually in Felton, kind of what we're doing is uh, we're doing we're doing a lot of kind of three day residencies in in Felton at very limited capacity. Um, you know some artists that would sell 350 tickets on a normal night, but we can only, you know, sell to, to 50 people. Uh, the, the best option is for them just to kind of hunker down in one city and, and, you know, make sure all their fans can see them, you know, makes their travel costs less and, you know, they can really just kind of hone in and, and, you know, get, get, get their show rolling. I, uh, I personally just love the idea as a fan too of of multiple nights. I love the idea of kind of like, you know, city takeovers where an artist will play, you know, three different venues around the city. Um, you know, I I think I think as we kind of progress, especially as a band, um, you know, as, as their career progresses. And you kind of, you know, keep playing, keep playing. You have to find more and more ways just to be creative. You have to be able to, like, you know, really keep that mystique up with who you are as a band. And being able to do unique things like that, where every time you go to a show, you don't know what you're getting. You're going into a different room. You're hearing new sound. You're interacting with new people. Uh, you're going into different neighborhoods. You're, you're, you're eating different restaurants when you go to the show. Like the, all these things, like add into the experience of, of of experiencing that band. And you know, I, I see certain acts every year that they, they play the Fillmore two nights. You know, and they've been doing it for ten years. And every year, like ticket sales slowly go down, slowly go down, slowly go down. And you know, I don't want to go to my same friend's backyard and barbecue every single weekend. Like, well, we want to switch it up. We want to go to a different place because it just like provides a new, unique experience. I'm down to have the same people there every time, you know, like I'm, I'm I'm down to more or less do the same thing. It's just, I I don't want to do it in in, in the same place. And for a fan, and I think we can all like kind of point to these experiences where you see something in a unique place where you, uh, where you know, you're getting something kind of special or it's just different that, that holds a lot of currency and just maintain the, the fan and the engagement of the fan. And I, I, I really push a lot for this. I push a lot for two nights when artists is maybe, you know, trying to maybe jump up to a, to a larger level or maybe an act is like kind of at a larger level and they're coming down. I like, I love the idea of doing two nights you know, before COVID, you know, we had two nights of built to spill on cornerstone. We did like two nights of infected mushroom. Um, you know, these are these are just really rad experiences. And not only that, you're, you know, these fans are getting these like intimate, like cool experiences. Uh, I, I, I really love it. And I think, you know, especially in COVID, as we try to climb out of this thing, uh, you're going to see a lot of artists kind of go in this route. You're going to see them just doing doing kind of a weekly gig in, in a regional market. You're going to see. Um, you know, you're going to see people do like three, four nights, like in, in a venue, you know, just, just to get things back on track, just to, I mean, probably limited by capacity of what they can actually do. Uh, not willing to like travel too far outside of their homes. And, you know, I, I think it's going to be a really good thing for, for music people, people to get like that experience and for us just feel more comfortable, like going back, back in the shows to begin with too. Uh, hopefully it sticks. I mean, I, I love, I love the intimate experience. I, you know, that's why I love just booking Felton Music Hall so much. I just like, I love that, that rad, like intimate vibe. 
I think people are willing to pay top dollar to see their artist in, in, in an intimate space. And, you know, I would, I would love to do more two nights of Jackie Green and Felton. You know, it's just, I, I, I just think that's the best experience. Duderman, guarantees or door deals? Door deals, Duderman. You know the right answer. <laughs> Don't protect yourself, man. Dangerous out there. All right. All right. What normally happens after a show is confirmed in terms of marketing communication with fans and artists? What is the flow? Uh, I mean, so obviously you figure out and announce an on sale date. I think that's like, you know, really the pivot point on, on everything. And, you know, you try to have as concise as possible marketing materials in hand that the promoter and the artists are all, are all pumping out. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm obviously just really always want everything to be as consistent as possible from the artist side to, to the promoter side for what everybody's seeing. So it, so, so, so there is like some type of consistency. Um, and, you know, with a lot of artists, they, they want you to communicate kind of like direct lingo, you know, they, they, they have like an exact phrase or they want you to like say something, you know, I, I sometimes feel the, the promoter knows how to communicate with their fans and their patrons the correct way. I try to yield that advice and um, obviously try to do as much as possible, but I, I, I do think that we as like promoters like know know how our fans like respond to things. Um, and then, you know, you're, you know, kind of in constant communication about what to do with that show going forward, uh, making sure that posters are printed and distributed, um, making sure that they're, you know, we're posting Facebook groups are, are up and, uh, people are communicating in, in, in those that are contacting publications and trying to get interviews. Um, just really trying to turn over every stone to make sure that the show is successful. Uh, of course, I always find the artists that are more engaged, the artists that are doing their work uh, on the shows, the artists that are con constantly looking for new ways to get people's attention shows are just more, more successful. It's just, it's just a natural thing. Uh, artists can kind of sit back and just rely on the promoter to, to kind of do everything and not engaging. It's just naturally never, never as strong. Again, it's a, it's a symbiotic relationship between the artist and the promoter. We are a team all in the same end goal. We want to sell as many tickets. We want to have people in the room. And the more we can kind of work creatively to, to get to that end goal, uh shows so shows just do better i you know i'm always very encouraged too when artists come to us with kind of unique ideas of, of what to do like one of my you know favorite things we did recently fiddler was playing two nights at cornerstone they were doing a show in catalyst and they were doing a show at fremont and slow and they wanted to come up with this kind of like unique marketing campaign so they wanted us and they were, they were doing it around a, a new record. So they came to us and they wanted to uh, make a stencil that said Fiddler and then like the show date and go to local skate parks and, you know, chalk it in. I don't know if you spray paint. I think we chalked in, you know, Fiddler and, you know, the show date and with like the album on it. And, you know, it worked. It, like people were reacting to it. People were like, you know, taking pictures of it and like posting it. And, you know, I think little things like that, like finding just kind of creative, unique ways to get the attention, something that might be a little different is, is in, incredibly valuable. And really like taking that time, and, you know, working with your promoter, working with the marketing team at, in the promotional office to come up with these ideas, to find something unique uh, is, is, is incredibly valuable. I mean, these, I mean, the promoters in the market, they know their market the best. They, they know the record stores. You know, they, they know the bookshops, they know the radio stations, 
you know, they, they, they know these unique things that, that you can do. And if you're approaching them and wanting to work with them to, to come up with these, like they're going to want to do it. I mean, we, we, we love booking shows and I, I, I personally love doing these like creative things that are fun and cool to, to make sure the shows go off successfully. Uh, so, so the more that that kind of stuff is happening, uh, I, you know, I, I, I think in the long term the the shows just naturally do better. Um, the flow of it though is a lot of it comes. What's kind of a unique thing now with uh, with agencies is there's a, like a tour marketing department. So a lot of times we're kind of just dealing with these like tour marketers, which can be can be really like positive. It can also be kind of just like a nuisance, um, but more or less it's it it's it's really positive. For our shows, we work we work very closely, uh, you know, with with kind of outside with verticals on a lot of our shows that help us market. And so these two people are communicating like constantly, you know, if like a new piece of music gets released, they send it, they post it. Uh, they're communicating with the fans in the Facebook group. Um, all that's, all that's really important now. If you're just a smaller artist, you know, making sure you're doing those kind of things, you know, something new just comes out or you have a new video, a new piece of content, um, really making sure you get that in, in into the right hands and asking your promoter to, promote it it's it's it, it's gonna it's gonna react what is my favorite room i book and why um well i don't want to you know say i i, I don't want this to come across like dislike booking into the room but you know like i was mentioning earlier phone, phones are new room up in the Santa Cruz Mountains. It's this beautiful little 350 cap room, like really in this tiny town of like 5,000 people up in the Santa Cruz Mountains, surrounded by redwood trees, walking distance to Henry Cal State Park, one stoplight town. There's literally no reason there should be a music venue in this town. Like there should be probably a, a coffee shop in a, in, a, in a bookstore and at a post office and maybe like that's it. But there's this magical little venue up there. It used to be Don Quixote's, um, which has been around the community since probably the 70s, which a lot of just very notable California artists have, have played everything, you know, from a lot of like the dead guys to, to Dave Alvin. Um, to a lot of people like in, in, in the reggae community as well. Uh, but it, I, I, I feel like it just didn't maintain itself. You know, the, the room kind of started to slowly like dwindle. What weren't taking care of it as much. It, it switched ownerships after that. And that didn't do very well. And, and we had this amazing opportunity to go in and uh, start working in the venue and was able to put new sound in there, kind of get new staff in there, kind of just rework little things within the venue to really make it like our own place, to make it a place that we as Ineffable would want to go see a show, a place that you know, we would want to go have a beer at and, and, and see the music that we really love. And, you know, we've done amazing things of, you know, starting membership programs, you know, made amazing, you know, like cool merch items and like we're able to make the logo the way that we want it to look, you know, we're going to get uh, amazing marquee outside and it's this it's this place where we can really just do it the way that we want to do it we can book the shows the way we want to book it like we can you know make you know the the, the bar the way we want it to be and the, for it to sound the way that we want to sound and with all that like we are and you know, we have this kind of perfect place in our minds that is very like true to us it's very true to how we operate as a company and it's just a place that, again, that uh, just ultimately feels really magical. And you go there, and you know, we, we Stephen Marley, you know, played up there. Robert Hill Keen, like, played up there, or he's gonna play up there. Um, Ricky Skaggs played up there. 
And we're able to kind of draw these artists into this, uh, again, this really small community, tiny, intimate, intimate venue. And the experience inside of it is just, it's just unlike anything else that we do. Uh, it's kind of funny, you know, you're looking at like route sheets and it's like Seattle, Portland, San Francisco, Felton, Los Angeles, Phoenix, Albuquerque. It's just like, felt like what is this like <laughs> Felton like doing here? I just get like such a kick out of it that this one, like this one little, you know, place of 5,000 people is just kind of, you know, sitting on that same ledge as these, these major markets and artists love it. They love being there. They want to come back. The staff is amazing. And uh, I just, I, I, I can't wait for the next like 10, 15 years of that place. Any pinch me, is this real moments in my career? Yeah, when COVID hit. Long live Felton. What up, Ant? Coming back from Portland anytime soon? <laughs> Come on, man. All right. What else we got in here? What are some of the fastest sellouts you've seen at a 300, 500,000 cap venue? I think the fastest sellout I had at a thousand cap was LMA. That was the fastest one I saw. Um, aside from that, it was probably the second time we did Shoreline Mafia was was the fastest sellout. But LMA, it went you know it went within like seconds. It was it was just it was just crazy. It was like right when boot up was like at peak boot up. Everyone was going crazy for it. It was a huge gift for us. She was playing 2,500 cap rooms. Um, yeah, it was, it was amazing. 500 cap. Let's see. The fastest one in Berkeley. Oh, I didn't want to. I didn't want to. It, it was, it was <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not a huge fan. It was Cody Co. and the Tiny Meat Gang. It's kind of like some immature, like comic humor. It's like these, like YouTube guys. Uh, concert though, probably the Duran Jones shows that we had. Those were those were some really really quick sellouts. San Luis Obispo, we did Will Smith. It sold out like crazy quick. Um, usually at the three hundred cap, when it does sell out, a lot a, a lot of this kind of like younger hip hop stuff, and we usually just try to bump it up like immediately. If something's like selling out at the atrium, it's like boom, like it just goes clean within, within the day, you know, I mean, we're just, we're looking to move it up. Like, and that's, that's, that's the first thing we're trying to do. Um, so a lot of the stuff that we have in the 300 cab usually doesn't, doesn't stay there for very, for very long. Um, yeah, it's been, <laughs> it seems like ages I've trying to like remember. It's funny, like, this is probably the most I've talked in like three months and, uh, <laughs> just trying to like use your brain and like use your memory of like what actually happened. Like, you know, we're in this weird time delirium where, you know, it seems like forever ago, but it really was only like six months ago. Some of this, some of this stuff happened. Uh, what kind of beer am I drinking? I'm drinking actually champagne and, and grapefruit juice. I don't know why I'm drinking this. I, I saw we had these like little bottles of champagne when my mom came over and she left one in the fridge. It's like really hot today. And I had some grapefruit juice and decided I would make it. It sounded really refreshing. Can we get the elevators headlined at the Fremont Theater and slow when stuff opens back up in 2020? I I, I think they maybe need a... A little, little more time to, to get to the Fremont, but we're like definitely working to get elevators like to that level. Uh, a lot of the acts that we work with, um, elevators being one of them, are you can see that like trajectory in them. Like the response is there. Uh, pe people are just like you know getting very feverish for them, and you can see it starting to get get to the West Coast. I you know personally don't think they're they're ready for a nine hundred. 
cap room, uh, it's really important to me always, you know, as a promoter to make sure artists don't skip steps too. I really don't ever want to put an artist in a situation where uh, they're going to show up into a room and it's going to be half full. And I think just as a fan, you kind of walk in there and you, you, you look around and you, you're like, you know, man, like it's only half full. Like my, my, are these guys not that cool or are they like, you know, am I missing something? And I think it's, I think it's really important to just build it the right way to always make sure that, you know, you're, you're, you're going up, you're going up. And, um, you know, I think for the, for the elevators, like they're going to get to that level. Like they are, they are like one of those acts that are on that trajectory. Um, but I think playing a smaller room in San Luis Obispo, uh, is, is the right move next time through most slow is a tough market too. Not, not a lot of acts can sell 900 tickets and slow. Um, what am I personally listening to most right now? I am. So me and my brother are in the process of kind of making this nineties hip hop playlist. And we're going through each year of the nineties and we're going and putting all like the best songs there. We're really trying to uh, delineate it where you can only choose one song from each album. So you can only, you can only have one song on the chronic. Can only have one song on AT Aliens. You can only, you know, uh, so it's it's tough, you know. Like you know, what 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 song do you choose from Outcast Equipment? I there's so many jams, but we're you know we're really putting a lot of time and effort in curating what we believe is going to be the definitive 1990s hip hop playlist. It's probably about 150 songs per year, and I've just been in this long late night process with my brother after he puts his kids to sleep in Chicago, just listening to, to nineties hip hop. And, and, uh, this is like just the shit I grew up on. And it's been a really fun walk down memory lane. Uh, something I just haven't done to in a while. I mean, COVID's COVID's this amazing time, like where we obviously, we all have like a lot of time on our hands and able to kind of maybe do these things where we haven't, you know, just, put as much time or effort into it. And really like music has been the thing that I've just done the most of. It's just like gone back and like picked up my record collection again. I've been like, you know, we, we made this like music video playlist for Felton's. I've just been watching like cool music videos and kind of curating a music video playlist and just listening to like tons and tons and tons of music. Um, I love it. Oh, Equimini or Stinkmini? Equimini. Equimini is like single-handedly a top, top 10 like greatest hip-hop records of all time. No, like no doubt about it. I mean, that, that, that record was like so progressive and so psychedelic and like poetic and just like such an amazing record. Stinkonia had like, I mean, they had some jams, they had the hits, but I think as a complete record, Equimini is the choice there. Um, what are some lesser known reggae bands you see moving up in the scene? Um, I was talking about them earlier. There's, you know, we're, we're actually doing a, their show next weekend in Felton, a local reggae band in Santa Cruz called Pacific Roots. Um, they, you know, done really well at, in, in Santa Cruz. Did a show in Felton, did really well. And, and, and you know, we're going to do these like two nights, very intimate fully seated it's tracking to hopefully sell out people are you know people are stoked to to go see them in that setting um and there's this other band that i'm like kind of annoyingly like uh, obsessed with called the delirians they're based out of los angeles they're just kind of like latino uh like soul reggae band that i that i just like absolutely love uh, they make, it's kind of like, it kind of falls in that like Duran Jones world, but it's, it's got, yeah, it's got, it's got like a lot of just like really cool reggae vibes live. They're just, they're, they're incredible, incredibly tight, amazing, like, you know, like musicianship on stage. The guy's voice like just gives me chills every time I see him live. Uh, yeah, he's great. 
And who's this other? Send it to Thomas. I'm looking it up right now. Oh, I don't know. All right. I think that is just about it. Oh, here we go. Do you think post COVID when cases have been at zero for months that ticket sales will immediately go back to normal because people are itching to see live music? That's a tough question, Adam. Um, I mean, just honestly kind of seeing the way people have like responded to Pacific Roots playing in COVID. Um, in Felton at a limited capacity in a, in a safe environment. But still, I'm sure there's probably people that want to see them that maybe aren't comfortable like going into a setting like that. Um, I think, like, yes, I think, I, I, I think the, I think the response is going to be through the roof. My, my biggest worry is, is that it's just going to be incredibly crowded and it's going to be incredibly like just the, the calendars of these venues and these markets. It's just going to be stacked with bands. So, it's going to be really hard to like filter through all of it. You're going to have like four or five shows a night, seven days a week in, in these venues. So yes, I think people are going to like want to go out. They're going to want to see shows and they're going to do it kind of immediately when it, when it happens. Uh, I do worry that some of the stuff will, will gobble itself up now. Like, so, so that means like maybe on any given night, there's like thousands of people in the market out of the show but will they all be at like one singular show? Uh, it's, it's hard to say just based on like what the, what the traffic's going to be, but yeah, man, people, people are hungry, you know, for this kind of stuff. And <clears throat> I just think any of these things that people are, we're so used to doing these, like these luxuries, um, you know, really that's what they are is just like these luxuries and they kind of didn't realize how good they had it and how much they really loved it, how much like it really meant to like, their, their psyche, their life, that they're, they're going to like immediately jump back into it. It's, a, it's, it's like, you know, seeing like a woman you love that you haven't seen in like months or something. And you're like going to run right back into their arms immediately. Um, you know, as far, as far as the economy though, I, I, that, that's my, that's honestly my biggest worry. You know, I think the psychology aspect of it, if people wanting to go is going to be there, but just knowing economically, um, what people are, are going to be able to afford to do is, is the real question. Now, like, I mean, you have to look at like what our major clientele is and it's, it's young people, probably fresh out of college, a lot of bartenders, a lot of restaurant workers, um, you know, like a lot of people just kind of like working multiple jobs in the city. And, and these are most of the people that, that lost their jobs or furloughed. Maybe when they go back to work, they're going to be going back to like 30% less than what they're making. So with all those factors, you know, are they going to go see a delirium show in, in Berkeley, California? Like, I, I, I don't know. I think obviously the marquee acts, the big acts, the, the, the stuff that really carries a lot of weight, you, like it, people shouldn't, shouldn't worry though. People shouldn't worry. <laughs> Have you thought about higher tickets and lower crowds? Yeah, I was talking about this earlier, and I, I this is personally like a model I really love, and this is just just a model that I like really like doing in general, and we do it we do it a lot in Felton, and this is kind of how we're able to to get a lot of these big acts to play. You know, we, we'll we'll charge, you know, fifty five sixty dollars to go see Stephen Marley in Felton. And because just our, our costs are lower in the venue and just easier to operate, you know, we're able to kind of put on the show more affordably. And, and people, the idea of going to see Stephen Marley in a 350 cap room in the middle of a redwood forest is like a really awesome idea. And that's something that people just want to do. They like they're, they're, they're willing to pay the extra $20 to, to go do that. So I think, you know, hopefully this is going to like open up a lot of avenues, especially at a smaller club for us 
to do this. And, and, and even maybe like if we're able to open up smaller venues before we're able to open up thousand cap, 1500 cap rooms, this is going to be the kind of the route that we're going to be able to, to go in. Um, but I, I, I personally like really, I, I just love that idea. And as somebody who's just like a music fan myself, you know, I, I would much rather pay, you know, more money to see a band at the Fillmore than go pay $30 to see them at Shoreline Amphitheater. It's just like hundred percent of the time. It's, it's just, there's no, there's no question. Um, it's going to be what artists are going to have to adjust to. And I think where it's going to work in smaller clubs favor is that they're just not going to be able to go out with the same type of production. They're not going to be able to travel with big rigs. They're not going to be able to have giant like crews out there. So they're going to have to like kind of go back to the basics. They're going to have to like strip their bands down. They're going to have to like kind of limit their crews, maybe get in the sprinter band again. And, you know, you're going to see a lot of like really great bands probably play smaller rooms or be able just to like kind of go in these rooms and make good, good money. And, you know, I, I, I think people are going to respond to that. I also think on top of that agents, bands, they're scared if they can sell 8,500 tickets at the Greek theater. So they're just like, well, let's just, just to ensure that we're going to be okay. Like we, we know, like it's probably a safer bet that we could sell 1,800 tickets at the Fillmore. Like, let's just go do that. Like, let's just go, let's just go, let's just go play. Let's just go play Cornerstone in Berkeley because we know we're going to sell 500 tickets. Um, rather than making a jump, rather than like trying to go up to the next bigger play. So I, you're, you're, I think you're going to see a lot of artists do this. You're going to see a lot of people do it. Uh, multiple nights you're going to see a lot of artists just hunker down in san francisco la major markets for 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 multiple nights and and, and play these smaller rooms um. all right see if i missed anything but i don't think so well it's really fun doing this you guys uh thanks for all the questions um, stay safe out there, stay sane, stay positive, and we'll see you on the other side. Thanks, y'all.